As a kid, I'd been to these gigs at Bonebroke Hall and St Aidan's Church up near the lower top. We used to have some strange sort of admission fees. It used to be slices of bread or boiled eggs. The hard boiled eggs, the slice of bread and the sticks of celery. In. If it was a, a hard boiled egg, it wouldn't let you in with a soft boiled egg. -ding. And you could even be caught with a forgery if the entry fee was a white slice of bread, you'd get wrong for bringing a brown bread, you wouldn't get in. When he was making the, the album Anna Ford's Bum, we decided to give it a go of going down to ITN in London to try and meet up with Anna Ford. She was approached by a man with an 18 inch polystyrene nose attached to his face. She stood there, she waited while he got down on one knee and proposed marriage. <laughs> and we took a couple of photographs to prove that, made the national newspapers. After that, I think he started to get a bit more famous. He managed to, to make the tube um, and establish one or two characters. I remember we were driving through London in the Waversmobile. Somebody sprayed a massive long nose along the length of the car. We uh, got ourselves a bit lost and headed off down a, a dead end. You could see we were from out the area because of the license plate on a car. And we realised that there was a car following. We're All of a sudden there was a screeching uh, of tyres. and it turned out to be the flying squad. And Car pulls up. And it was just like Regan and Carter on the telly. It was a Sweeney actually. And they started to search under the seats and asked me to get out and open up the, the boot. When I used to um, leave the area, I always asked to have um, masks and stuff like that. And we have us had a chair leg wrapped in Christmas wrapping paper. But he said, is it all right? We searched the back of the car. Looked in the boot, took one look at the, all the things that were in there and started saying, sticks and masks, son. You could get 15 years for this. I think I said the baseball bats were a Christmas present for my mother. But very shortly after he was harassing me at the boot of the car, Wavis and another lad who were in the back seat donned their 18 inch polystyrene conks and stuck their heads out the back window and said, can you tell us what's wrong, officer? At which stage I think he decided that we were pretty much crazy and there was no point in trying to pursue inquiries. Good plan. Right, you need to switch it off now. Anybody could have shot at me, and, every, and everybody did it, didn't they? Everybody had a go at having, having a go at the punk band. They start off actually in heaven, Miss King's night club in heaven, and it was a cellar. I remember now we thought we're the business here, we're, we're, we're rubbishly. <laughs> and we've done the first gig, and we jumped round over and pulled the leads up the amps, and the, the, the pier caught on fire. And the singer over and blew it out. <laughs> His amp was on fire. He actually blew the amp out, you know. We obviously wanted to finish it with them with three songs, like it was an absolute disaster. We thought well, maybe this is a bit harder than we thought it would be like. <laughs> and you say to the promoter. It basically written by myself. Will took it away, taped it up, set it all out on the fiddle because his, his grand grandma was a secretary at Capital Street Police Station. So whenever no one was there, then it was actually printed at the police station when they were out on the call. We were running photocopies off of the fanzine at the police station. That's where it was all printed at, free of charge. But the singer, the original singer, the Fiend Kev, the uh, he said he was going to get Mohican, so we said we're going to do it for him, Lee. So we cut this Mohican for him, and it started there, went round the side yard. <laughs> so it's pretty hard to cut a Mohican, and we didn't realise it cut went round the lot, Lee, so it looked rubbish. So we painted it with yellow gloss paint. <laughs> <laughs> then the punk scene started, and that changed things for me. Instead of being somebody who was an observer in music, all of a sudden I thought, well, I can do it. It was just, I guess, we wanted to be heard and jump up and down and say, I'm here, I exist. Well, it was just our life. It was like everything about it. We're just in it from the beginning. Definitely um, just pushing things to the alternative, trying to come up with something different. What the influence we had on each other. What came out, came out. It was a bit off the wall. It could be a bit weird, but there wasn't much else like it. people who can be so productive and just come up with ideas when you bounce off each other that's the best part of the music you don't have to sit for years and think am I good enough you just go out there if they like it they like it if they don't like it they don't come see you the very first gig we played in front of six people and then the next gig we played we played in front of 12 so we thought we'd really doubled up <laughs> We 
discovered a, a, a cine camera. It just popped out the blue. And we shot the videos ourselves on as cheap as possible. And only had four minutes of film in end days, you know. So I bought a couple of rolls of film. I think the first video cost 24 quid. Used it and did animation and just let our imagination rip. You can't make them like that anymore. Like, you know. I wasn't sure one of them. <laughs> It was a way out for what I consider to be uh, working class kids. You didn't have to uh, be a, a student at art school. You didn't have to be uh, prolific in music. You could just bang a dustbin lid and you were away, mate. Well, me, Mency and Decker had known each other since we were kids. We used to, we used to hang out at the shops at Broccoli Winds. It was a... Um... He had that, I'm forming a band, and you, you were going to be the drummer, and I wasn't doing too much at the time, I thought, well, it would be a bit practice. We used to rehearse uh, initially in a, a youth club called Percy Hudson in, um, in Bit of Call, and I seem to remember the first gig was there, I think we did a show for the kids. And we only knew six songs. <laughs> youth there, so we played the, we played the same six songs with three times. We found out you got hired at Bolingbrook Hall in South Shields for about £10 or something like that. And we had a big enough following by them to be able to do that. He's got two or three hundred people in. We used to play there regular. Well, that's when people started to sit up and, and take an interest. And then we all got our heads together and started writing, you know, like, like Mency, I mean, prolific songwriter. My lyrics mainly are just uh, the easiest lyrics in the world to write because I just write about what's happening around us, you know? You know, I think the rest fucking history after that, isn't it? Next thing you know, you're on fucking Top of the Pops and... We should have got on Top of the Pops with Armin Upstart, because it got number 31, and it stayed in the chart a few weeks, but they just wouldn't have one. Top of the Pops, I remember it. Um, we did Teenage Warning, I think it went to about 29 or something in the chart. We're on there uh, once. Oh, it's just a horrible, cold Stuart studio, it's like a, like a warehouse with four stages in it, and there was only about 20 or 30 people in the audience. It was like a nothing. There was no atmosphere, and it was just like playing a big warehouse. It was uh, it was horrible, really. it wasn't it wasn't a nice experience. You know? The only good thing I'd done is I sang live, you know? And they wanted to run mine, but I wouldn't, so that was, that was something. There was three big helps in my early days. Number one would have been uh, John Peel actually played the uh, Little Towers when nobody else would, because I believe it got banned. And then Phil Sutcliffe. He came to see you and uh, he gave our first full big write up in a, in a music paper, the sounds he did a, a feature on was centre page spread. And then Gary Bushell. Gary was working for the sounds at the time, so he saw the write up that Phil Sutcliffe did, and he was so into punk, he said, I've got to go and see these lads. There used to be something in the sounds every week about us. If it wasn't a single review, it was an album review or a gig review, it, there wasn't any new records out. We used to just phone up and make stories up, and he used to just, used to just print whatever we gave him. I never thought I would uh, ever be with EMI Records and do an album in Abbey Road Studios, where the Beatles used to use. We were in the studio too, the one they actually used. If I was sitting in the shipyards putting lights up and type 42 destroyers, if somebody said you're going to do an album in Abbey Road, I would just laugh. I was just like, I'm, I'm, I'm an alright guitarist, I'm not a great guitarist, but I kind of see it happening. Ha ha! Oh, happy days.